Chaotic, and they're picking on the weak and defenseless. So we teach a bunch of girls how to defend themselves. They are grateful to us. Adrenaline is flowing. Next thing you know, Isabel and Brittany are kissing us on the mouth. I know how to market it, and I know who we can sell it to. But I want 50% of the company, and I've got to be CEO. I don't know who you think you are, but deal. Are you joking? I feel like I need some popcorn for this segment. Boy, oh boy, has it been a good year for the movies. Those are just a few of the standouts that made it into Eli's top 23 films of 2023. From raunchy high school revenge comedies to the return of the King of Monsters cinemas are back in full swing after the industry slowed to a halt earlier this year, the result of two major Hollywood strikes. So the movies are back, and we've only gotten started uh, with Eli's list. We're going to talk about the top five here. Uh, Eli, in fifth place, we have the only superhero flick on the list. It's the only one, but well-deserved. Let's take a look. Sp oh, I love this one. There you go. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Yeah, I think we have a little, little animation for you. Da -da -da. Da -da. Okay, <laughs> so here's the thing about Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Yeah. On the surface level, it is so beautiful and so bold. What they did with just the animation style, their ability to accentuate each different spider person, pig, hero, whatever. Agreed. So you have spider punk who looks like a concert poster left out in the sun, faded and torn. The expressive nature of Spider Gwen with these beautiful shifting pastels. So I could just put it on my list because of what it's done for the art form. But the nub, the heart of that film yeah. is so perceptive about the tension between a teenager and his parents. Miles Morales trying to define himself, trying to figure out, become his own man, become his own Spider-Man. Sure. He's got this whole side life. He can't even tell them. And yet they want to just protect him and love him and hug him. And so I, just remarkable, beautiful, the way, like, it's so gorgeous to look at, and yet, to me, really, it's the storytelling, and there's so many beautiful moments of the script. The only negative thing I have to say is yeah. that it didn't resolve. It's one of those, like, Right, well, you gotta wait, right? Kill, stop <laughs> doing closure. Remember closure? Remember closure, Hollywood? You're gonna go so to the next go. one, though. You know what? I actually was like, I don't know if I want to go see this. It's yeah. animated, my friend was like, come to see it. I love that film. It's fantastic. Okay, um, switching gears to the first of two biopics uh, that stood out this year, uh, Bradley Cooper project about a legendary musician. Yeah, let's take a look at our fancy graphic to get us in the mood. Da -da -da. There we go. Beautiful. And Thank you, graphics department. Of course, that is Maestro. Maestro. You can enjoy it at home or okay. if you can, go see it in a theater. Now, it's been interesting, Travis. There has been a bit of what I would call film bro backlash to Maestro now. Now that it's out and consumable, and I think it's because Cooper's a big star, and he did an interview talking about he doesn't like people to sit down when he's directing, and you know, he's a handsome guy, but I've been re-watching this film, and I am still so entranced by the vignettes, by the snapshots he put of a life together. And like so many movies here, it's about this imperfect relationship where, yes, there is this giant, there is this titan, there is this amazing composer, Leonard Bernstein, as played by Bradley Cooper, who disappears into the world. But there she is, that woman in the shadows, Felicia. Uh -huh. And even though he does wrong by her. And even though she says she's willing to sacrifice, but the movie is about living with that sacrifice. And even though the relationship has its flaws and strains still at his best, at his height, he is nothing if he doesn't look to his left or his right and see her there waiting in the, in the wings. And it's that, it's that contradiction. It's like the strangest kind of love story. So that is... 
That is my number four. <laughs> I love your reviews, Eli. I got like so into it. emotionally. It sounds so great. I, I haven't seen that flick, but I do want to check it out. Okay, it is time to get a little bit weird. Uh, this yes. next one feels a bit like a fever dream, and it features <laughs> uh, Emma Stone in one of her most extraordinary roles yet. Tell us about it. All right, let's take a look. We have our graphic. Here it is. We are talking about, of course, poor, poor things, things, a little bit of electricity, because in a way, mm -hmm. this is a Frankenstein story. You have a woman, played by Emma Stone, Bella Baxter, who was dead, and her sort of father, scientist, played by Willem Dafoe, brings her back to life. But what we don't know when we start watching, the reason she seems so primitive when the movie begins, she's got a child's brain in a woman's body. And so that almost makes her like she's discovering everything fresh okay. for the first time. But as she evolves and as she grows, she's got an appetite. She's got this hunger. She wants to experience everything that life has to offer. Now, I will tell you, uh -huh. at first, one of the things she wants to experience, like any of us, is pleasure, pure pleasure. And we're talking pleasure of the body. We're talking sex. <laughs> she wants all of it. She has an appetite. And the film is bold and audacious and hilarious. But then it's about more than that. It's about feeding her brain and her soul. And because she's grown up in this sheltered environment, mm -hmm. she doesn't know the way women are supposed to behave. She doesn't know what polite society demands, so she isn't polite. She doesn't care. She is breaking up the rules or making them up as she goes along. It is hilarious. It is so smart. It is centered by this amazing performance. The aesthetic of the film, it looks like it was dipped in tie-dye. It's got this kind of psychedelic oh, cool. color scheme. And then Mark Ruffalo. Yeah as this lawyer Love him. who yeah. whisks her away and takes her to Lisbon. We know Ruffalo, you might know him as the Hulk guy. You don't know how good he is. He can barely keep up with Emma, but it's so great to see him back and, and having a blast. So that is a uh, number three poor thing. Well, she's got a lot of range, doesn't she? She's, she's fearless. Okay, back to the biopics, and I think that we uh, know uh, what's next. This It's uh, half of one of the hot double features of the year. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about this half of the other double feature. So this is this yeah. was part of Barbenheimer. So of course Barbenheimer. We were, we were talking about not sorry folks, no Barbie on my list. What? Yep, just just Oppie. Just Oppenheimer. And here's the thing. <laughs> and here's the brill do you remember the excitement about oh my Christopher Nolan has yeah. had like yeah. he, we thought he'd set off a nuclear warhead, right? right? Like we knew it was like one of the largest explosions ever filmed, and he did it just no CGI, capturing it on screen. And the, the brilliance of Nolan is understanding we need the spectacle, and so that's what got us in the theater to see that bomb go off, to see that moment when the first atomic bomb was detonated. But the movie, that's just the carrot. The movie is so much more than that. The movie is about this scientist wrestling with the consequences of this thing that he has brought into the world and he knows he has to do it and yet there's the doing it and then living with the new world that he is now inhabiting and then that multi-layered structure that goes back and forth all Got it. orbiting around that performance by Killian Murphy Remarkable. So that is the number two. Yes, three hours or whatever, fine by me, amazing. I, it was long indeed. Uh, okay. Da, 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 da. Number one here. Okay, at number one, we have a master of his craft returning with an epic western, complete with an epic runtime as well. Yes. Uh, what do we got? Three and 12 minutes or something like that. I, I, I adored every second. And number one is Killers of the Flower uh -huh. Moon. Just. I, 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 what has been so amazing for me has been the conversation around this film. Right. In terms of like whose story gets told and whose story does get told. And I think one of the fascinating things about this film from Martin Scorsese, he knows that. Uh -huh. And if you remember how that film ends with the director himself stepping on stage, he is acknowledging his limitations. This film is about the erasure of a people, mm -hmm. of Osage Nation, but by using Leonardo DiCaprio and Lily Glad Stone and that relationship at the center it brings us in so you see firsthand the evil that we can commit and the 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 
the amazing thing and the horrible thing of the human heart that you can do both. That Ernest is capable yeah. of being party to this horrible crime and yet still, if you believe, loving his wife. Amazing. That's what movies are all so about. So much Oscar buzz around that one as oh, yeah, well, right? Sure. Lily's, gonna... Lily's already got it. Yeah, Guaranteed. you think so? Okay. Yeah.